Hi everyone, Sue here. I'm hoping this will be a fairly short uh, lecture and I really just wanna cover the essentials of interprofessional practice. From your readings, you'll see this is chapter one in the text and I'm gonna follow fairly closely uh, chapter one. So uh, listen to the audio, watch the PowerPoint slides, I'll post those as well. And also make sure you read the chapter and um, the, take part in the posting as required. Yikes, uh, the, my computer's a little glitchy, so I hope this isn't a problem, but let's carry on for the moment and see how it goes. So today I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we define interprofessional practice or as we're gonna use uh, throughout the rest of the course, the short form IPP, and what are the core concepts? So what is essential to interprofessional practice? I'm also gonna talk about the context, in particular, uh, the Canadian context. We'll talk a little bit about the background of interprofessional practice development around the world. Uh, particularly in Great Britain, in the United States, and then how this is influenced in Canada. And then we're going to take stock. Where are we today? What do we know? And what's, uh, what are the directions that we're seeing emerging for the future? And then uh, either in this description or in a subsequent PowerPoint, I'm going to talk a little bit about an organizing framework. So how do we organize our assessment of interprofessional practice within any kind of um, healthcare context? So the kinds of units that you may work on now or in the future, various healthcare settings, things like that. Now there's a, li a link here for a short YouTube video. It's so worth watching and this is going to be repeated in your discussion board, so not to worry about that. Um, but have a, take a moment to really watch this clip. It's really fascinating. It gives you such an important um, understanding of the benefits of IPP, why it's so essential to our own practice, but also to healthcare moving into the future, and it does it in two minutes. Okay, let's start with this. What's in a name? And I think all of us have heard probably all of these names. In this course and in the textbook, we talk about interprofessional practice, or IPP. You'll also read about collaborative practice. And in that we see um, that reference to working together, right? Collaborative. Uh, another, another term that we'll see in the literature is interprofessional collaborative patient-centered practice. Now, that starts to be a bit of a mouthful, but what you see there is a little bit of a merging of the first and the second terms. Interprofessional means that we're working with multiple different professions, right? So the physiotherapist, the respiratory therapist, an occupational therapist, a pharmacist, a physician, a nurse uh, who may be a registered nurse, a registered practical nurse, or an RNEC nurse practitioner, uh, a range of people. But also what this includes in that collaboration is uh, patient-centered. So at the very center of practice is always the patient. It's important to recognize, and we're gonna see this as we move through our understanding of interprofessional practice, that in the most robust, the fullest understanding of interprofessional practice, the patient is not just at the center of practice in that we always consider their wishes and their desires, but the patient is a member of the interprofessional practice team. So we're not uh, acting on the patient or working uh, around the, the best um, efforts to ensure the best outcomes for our patients, but the patient is at the center of being part of the team in determining what are the best approaches to their care. Another um, uh, term that we'll see in the literature is interprofessional collaborative practice. They start to sound the same now, don't they? Or interprofessional collaboration. So let's look at how these terms are, some, are, are variously defined and start to pull out what are common themes. What are we seeing in them all? Now, sometimes students ask me, do I want you to memorize all these definitions? No, the point in going over this just for a moment is to really understand that you'll see different terms, but the, the terms ultimately are alluding to some very common themes. And those are the themes that we've picked up in, our te in the textbook that you've got for this course in the various chapters. So the common uh, ideas, that are really essential to drill down in. So let's start with interprofessional practice and a couple of de uh, definitions. First, that it's designed to promote active participation of all the disciplines. So not just that we have a team of different uh, professionals all sort of sitting together in a room, but that everybody is actively involved in that patient care and that that really promotes patient and family-centered goals, right? Uh, that we make sure that um, the values of the patient and the family are centered to what we are um, focusing on and that there's really strong and continuous communication that's happening amongst all the various healthcare providers. 
In another definition, we see that it talks about fully integrated practice. So that's practice where all members of the team are communicating and practicing in a, in a seamless, interconnected way. And the, and the backgrounds of the professionals are very diverse. So we're not all working from the same frame or the same background knowledge, but we bring our own expertise to the situation. Uh, we also, um, if importantly, not only know our own role and have an understanding of what our own knowledge base is, but we understand the knowledge base of the other professionals on the team. And that's really important when we talk about role clarity in another class. And so within that definition, we also see that when two or more professionals purposely interact in order to learn with, from, and about each other, that's really important. We're learning with each other, we're learning from each other, and we're learning about each other. That improves the effectiveness of the care that we provide and that's why it's so critical that we learn about interprofessional practice that we practice interprofessionally but that also when we have learning opportunities we bring in other professionals into our classes okay collaborative practice that was one of the other terms and so here let's look at a couple definitions uh, interprofessional process for communication and decision making that's essential to healthcare isn't it um, we also see that it enables knowledge and skills of the providers to really um, come together in a very fluid way to influence the care that we provide. The World Health Organization uses this term, uh, and it talks about uh, multiple health workers from different professional backgrounds providing comprehensive, so really a broad base of services. And they work with patients, families, other caregivers, uh, communities to deliver the highest quality care. So important, and you see, start to see the real advantage of this um, uh, collaboration within our practice. Now this one was the mouthful, remember, interprofessional collaborative patient-centered practice. And so again, we'll, uh, this is one of the most common definitions by Curran, the practice orientation, so it's an orientation to how we uh, practice nursing and other health uh, services. And it really, again, does this sound familiar? Active participation of multiple disciplines. So not just that we're all on the team and we list them, check, 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 all these people are here, but everyone is actively involved. Continuous interaction happens between two or more uh, professions or disciplines. And we have a common goal of uh, creating the best possible care for our patients and maximizing patient participation in their care. Um, let's look on. Interprofessional collaborative practice. Uh, and we see that this is uh, somewhat similar. Look at the, uh, as I read it or as you read it, uh, look at the commonality that we see with the other definitions. It's guided by shared values. We've heard that a common purpose or a care outcome. So we're trying to achieve the best possible outcomes for our clients. There's mutual respect. Now that's the first time we've heard of it, but so critical, and we know that's so critical to practice. Um, effective communication, and we've heard that before, how important a communication is to maximizing um, or optimizing outcomes and supporting clinical decision-making. Again, we've heard that. It evolves over time, and this is an important consideration that interprofessional practice requires trust and other things that we're gonna talk about a little further in the course, but all of those things take a little bit of time. Relationship building takes some time. It also takes flexibility, and this definition talks about that. And importantly, it goes on to say, it needs to be supported through healthcare policy, through the protocols that we have in institutions like your own, uh, and procedures at all levels in decision making, right? So the policies and procedures that you see within your hospital setting, within your unit, within a community-based setting, uh, across any kind of healthcare setting. And that includes things like government, professional associations, regulatory bodies, and all those healthcare organizations. Oh my gosh, are we still talking these definitions? We're almost done. Interprofessional collaboration. Now, there's almost nothing new here. Partnership between a team of health providers and a client in a participatory, so that means everyone is involved. We've talked about active involvement, active engagement already. Collaborative, we've talked about that. And a coordinated, we've talked about that. Approach to, guess what? Shared decision making. It's all starting to sound familiar, and that's the point. Even though they're slightly different words, this should all start to sound familiar. That you, should all, you should get some of the key themes that we're pulling out. Um, and really, again, we talk, when we talk about interprofessional collaboration, uh, you'll see in the next definition, they talk about teamwork among health professionals and to provide comprehensive, high-quality care. So what were the common characteristics? And here's what I've pulled out. If you see something else, let me know, and I'm happy to, to really look at a little bit deeper, but this is really what we see, collaboration. And collaboration is central to nursing practice and healthcare in all forms. Teamwork, healthy teamwork, communication, decision-making, and ultimately person-centered care. 
And it's so important to recognize that as we move through the course, those are the exact things we're going to talk about. And we'll see them uh, as, we, as we move through the weeks in the course. And we'll delve really quite deeply into all of those characteristics, how we see them in practice, how we can foster them in practice and be part of developing really good collaboration, really strong teamwork, um, effective communication in both good situations and really challenging situations, how to promote the best possible decision making, and ultimately recognizing what does person-centered care look like. So for the moment, let's talk about those concepts just briefly. So collaboration, and I think we all have a good sense of this, it's when you know a couple of people come together, could be two people, could be three, could be 17, but two or more come together and we're, we are working around a common goal. And in that work, we have a process. So we need to develop some way uh, that we're going to work, the, the ways that we work, and that's the process. We need to develop good relationships and have interactions that are both effective and uh, geared towards some outcome. And even if you don't perceive yourself to be part of a team, it's important to recognize that collaboration is essential. Healthcare cannot happen outside of collaboration. So even if you think you're in a job where you work quite independently, ultimately, if you drill down deep enough, you'll see that there is essential collaboration that's happening. But it's important to recognize at the same time, collaboration is highly complex. If only it was a simple, you do this, I do that, these are the rules for collaboration, and we'll all be successful, then uh, healthcare would be a lot easier. But collaboration is nuanced, it takes many different forms, uh, and it's really important to recognize what are the hallmarks of effective collaboration and where it seems to fall off the rails. Collaboration is not forced, it's voluntary. So it means that I choose to participate in that kind of practice with someone else, in that kind of uh, partnering relationship. And so, and it's really based on these underlying concepts, uh, sharing, a sharing of power, a sharing of um, information, a sharing of knowledge, and a sharing of trust. It is uh, fundamentally about partnership. Power is an important concept within all of this because it means that one person is not dominant within any inter interaction within, within any team, but rather there is a sharing of that power and a willingness to really um, consider all of ourselves equal. No, but there's no hierarchy. There's no boss in a, in a collaboration. We're all part of a team. And there's an interdependency. We rely on each other. What do we know about teamwork? I and mean, hopefully you've had really great examples of teamwork in your um, uh, education or in your uh, career, but also I bet you've had examples where it's felt like you're on a team that's not really functioning all that well. Teamwork at its best is really just defined as two or more people, and in our case, it would be health professionals, working together, so working interdependently. So not just side by side, we both have an assignment, we both go about our duties, but we're working together. We're, we are dependent on each other for various aspects of what uh, the care it is that we're trying to provide. Uh, and again, the, co the components of that interaction would be some kind of process. So how are we doing it? The way that we're doing it, that working together. There's a goal that we're trying to achieve. So is it that we are looking after clients collaboratively and our goal is to ensure that all of the clients um, have all of their care needs met over a period of time, but also recognizing that teamwork, that interaction that's part of teamwork is dependent on healthy relationships. So it's relationally based. Teamwork relies on cooperation and that idea of collaboration. It also requires that we share information. We don't hold information to ourselves, but we share that openly and freely, and that we have a good understanding of how teams function. We're gonna spend an entire week really talking about teams and how effective teamwork happens. Okay, communication. I know all of you have taken courses in communication, so let's cover this in a couple of words, but really understand that as much as we learn about communication, where it hits the road is in practice and how effectively you actually communicate. So, uh, simple definition, process of acting on information. What? Isn't communication just sharing information? Ultimately in healthcare, it's not just sharing information, it's not just words being passed around, but we actually involve an element of acting on that information. There's content that we share, but within any kind of communication, there's also relational aspects. So we're in relationship with other people and we convey emotion, we convey um, uh, whether we are um, receptive to another human being and other kinds of things. What it does require is that transmission of concise, timely, and important information. Without question, nurses are effective, and there's techniques for that. One of them, uh, many of you have learned, is SBAR, right? 
um, that uh, situation background assessment recommendation, a mechanism by which we can con convey information uh, concisely, timely, and really effectively. There are many different strategies. Um, we wouldn't be walking around in our uh, typical healthcare setting talking to our colleagues using SBAR communication. That's for um, high level communication in order to get a, a response effectively. But there are many ways that we can find to communicate much more effectively with team members that we, that we work with on a daily basis. It also requires that we really promote the relationships between and among team members. Uh, finally, we look, we're going to look at communication styles. And that's how uh, you or I or anyone uses both uh, verbal and nonverbal communication to signal to other people how they should be interpreting the messages. So it's not just the words that I use, but it's the other signals that I get. So if I say to you, um, yeah, I'm fine, I'm having a good day, that gives you a message. And if I say to you, yeah, I'm fine, I'm having a good day, that gives you a message. They're different messages, although I've used the same words. So recognizing the verbal and nonverbal cues in communication are equally important. And many people would suggest that the nonverbal cues are actually much more important. But we're gonna talk about that later when we talk much more deeply about communication. Um, and just recognizing that within our own professions, there's a socializing influence around communication, that we are socialized to communicate in uh, certain ways. Often the different professions and the power that they have typically held in healthcare influences how they've been socialized to communicate within their own um, discipline. So for example, uh, physicians have often been socialized to communicate in a very forceful, uh, self-assured, um, authoritative way. And nurses historically were socialized to communicate in a very um, mild, I don't wanna say timid, but mild way. So for example, in, rather than have a confrontation with someone we might, uh, particularly someone we might perceive perceived to have more power, we might uh, frame the way we were, uh, our thoughts as a question. Mm, do you think this patient might need an ultrasound as opposed to a uh, more assertive, uh, this patient is having abdominal pain with acute um, elevation and white blood cell count. Um, my assessment would suggest that uh, there's a risk for appendicitis um, without making a diagnosis. My recommendation is that um, he potentially needs an ultrasound. A much firmer communication. That's new to nursing. Uh, we have uh, typically played what's called the nurse-doctor game where we, we would defer and try to get our, uh, our um, needs met our, in relation to our patients with a much milder approach uh letting sort of often under the under, under the current letting doctors believe that it was actually their idea we don't play that game anymore but you'll still see the roots of it in much of communication and we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to that topic oh decision making so central to what we do so important and nurses are very good decision makers but we also make decisions under really challenging circumstances so we'll talk about that in greater detail as well but ultimately what decision making is, is that we're making a choice between a variety of options. And often there's not an obvious a correct choice. So if, if, if something was obviously right and something was obviously wrong, it's not really a decision, uh, it's just an obvious choice. It, uh, when it, decision making often involves making a choice between multiple options that on the surface would seem equally positive, equally appropriate. And so there's some element of problem solving that often comes into decision making. Now decision making occurs as an individual. You as nurses have made many decisions um, about your clients and about uh, your healthcare setting and other kinds of things. And also happens as a collective level, as a team you may make decisions. Um, and just as we talked about some of the other concepts, it's complex, so, so complex. Uh, and often really dependent on a, the amount of information we have in the moment and how we're able to process that information, which can really muddy the water. Um, we now move it, have moved into a model where we have the patient as the center of care and the patient as part of that, the healthcare team. And we talk about shared decision making, where the patient's actively involved in, in uh, the decision making in regards to their own care process. And then finally, person-centered care. Uh, central to interprofessional practice, and I talked about that. The patient is at the center of care. 
but not being acted upon. They're fully involved in their own care. And again, just to the extent that they choose to be. Some patients may say, I don't want to be involved. I don't want to have to make all those choices. And we would also honor how they would like their care to unfold using that type of approach. But typically, what we know is the best patient outcomes are associated with patients being as actively involved as possible in their own care. Important to respect their autonomy, listen to their needs, and also listen to their needs of their family, and engage with them as members of the healthcare team. So you'll see in this chapter, um, there's a little bit of a historical review that looks at interprofessional practice. And it's worth talking about this only because some people think interprofessional practice is new. Now, certainly the development of interprofessional practice has reached a stage where we can talk about it in much more detail. We have evidence-based approaches. We really have developed a good research base that talks about the efficacy of certain approaches. But the idea of working collaboratively within healthcare teams is not new. In fact, it's more than 100 years old. We see a real surge of um, interprofessional or multidisciplinary approaches in World War II, where there was a limited, limit, uh, limited number of resources. And so we saw all health professionals having to work to the peak of their capacity and working uh, effectively together. We saw it again in the 1960s in the United States when they were really trying to move to um, different models of care that uh, provided services to poor or underserved um, citizens. And we saw it again in the United K as they in the in the UK as they moved towards these interprofessional units that focused on um, geriatric patients, so providing best possible care to complex geriatric patients. In North America, we see a turning point through the 70s and 80s <coughs> um, as a couple of key elements happen. Um, the uh, Institute of Medicine held a, con a conference that really focused on what are the what is the the uh, approach to care that's going to get us the best possible outcomes. And that, uh, that conference ultimately identified interprofessional practice, and it was followed by a decade of funding into the development of models and the evaluation of models for interprofessional practice. A couple of other things really focus, uh, focus our attention this way. We see the healthcare revolution happening in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, where um, there's a variety of different approaches uh, to healthcare emerging. There are new um, uh, specific conditions that are uh, impacting us. The aging population that begins to start. We see um, onset of diseases like HIV AIDS that really attacks the healthcare system. And we also see uh, patients who are developing a new understanding of their role within their own health and their own health care. And so we're asking to be part of it. And we see that continuing today. And so how does this impact us uh, within Canada? A couple of points are really critical. When we've talked about um, uh, our issues around the world, we see Great Britain has their own approach to interprofessional care. We see the United States has their own approach to interprofessional care. But within Canada, two points that are important to make. One, that Canadians see health as a right, not a privilege. That the, when asked over and over, despite the challenges with funding our Canadian healthcare system and the challenges associated with how burdened the healthcare system may be, that Canadians view healthcare as the tie that binds. The thing that makes us unique as a country is our fundamental belief that all Canadians and all those who are eligible deserve healthcare. That is our human right to the best healthcare and to be healthy. Uh, and, then, and, and those ideas are entrenched within the Canada Health Care Act, which has um, uh, now been established for many years. 1984 is the last year in which that was opened. Uh, and these are the principles that I know you all know. Uh, public administration, comprehensiveness, universality, accessibility, and portability. So how does all this intersect with interprofessional practice? You'll read in your chapter that there are a couple of key um, conferences or reports that are really central to this. In 2002, a very famous uh, Canadian, he used to be a, a provincial premier of Saskatchewan, um, uh, was part of um, uh, really looking at, at how Canadians viewed health and how they um, uh, looked at the values that, under, that underscored health care in this country. And the question was, do we dismantle the Canadian healthcare system? Is it still serving us or not? And what do we do with it? Uh, building on values, the future of healthcare in Canada was essential in that report. Uh, and uh, you'll see it is also called the Romano Report. It's adopted, uh, adopting interprofessional education was one of the key recommendations. We'll talk about interprofessional education within this course, but ultimately 
understanding that interprofessional education supports interprofessional practice. In 2005, a Health Council of Canada again had a report and critical findings central to what we're talking about were that we need to accelerate the movement to new delivery models, including interprofessional practice, remove the regulatory barriers that make health professionals think that they can't collaborate because of others' differences in regulation, and change our education models so that we are learning with and about each other, so we're in the same classroom. Finally, 2005, again, we have another national report that's really critical where we talk about expanding opportunities for interprofessional education and resolving concerns that we have about liability when we, when we practice uh, together, who's responsible, who's liable if something doesn't go well. And we're gonna talk about that in this course in particular, there's a whole chapter about that. So why, PP, why IPP, and we're almost at the end of this lecture. A Couple of things, patients have better care. Patients' outcomes are improved when we practice interprofessionally. Patients are happier with the care and more positive about the care they receive. They have greater access to services, and that's really critical. When we look at jurisdictions across the country, there's shorter wait times and better coordination of care, better self-care. Patients learn to take better care of themselves. In particular, we've got that evidence with BP control and diabetes and uh, quality of life. And then we find that there's decreased emergency room visits and fewer hospital visits. What about providers? This is critical. Improved from provider attitudes towards interprofessional collaboration and more positive perceptions. Once you practice interprofessionally, you will never go back. Healthcare providers working in interprofessional collaborations are more satisfied with the work they do and they experience their work more positively. Uh, they have enhanced knowledge and skills. Uh, when you watch that short video, you'll see just how quickly uh, they, uh, people who work in healthcare providers who work in interprofessional settings accelerate their knowledge and skills versus uh, healthcare providers who are working in uni professional settings. And then improvement in your awareness and understanding of the roles and the scopes of practice of other professionals. Uh, what about the system? Increased healthcare system efficiency, improved access to healthcare services, and enhanced coordination of healthcare services. So we see at the patient level, at the provider level, and at the system level, there are so many positive outcomes, and that's really critical. And then finally, there's a, a little bit in chapter one, we're gonna talk an entire week about um, interprofessional education, but ultimately understanding that the underpinning of interprofessional practice is interprofessional education. So within this course, we have some elements of interprofessional education, ultimately the best approach to interprofessional education is when you are in a classroom with other professions you are learning with and about each other. Uh, and we've known this for many years and it's recognized not only in Canada, but around the world and the World Health Organization highly advocates that we move to this model of interprofessional practice with a core of interprofessional education. Well, it's been a pleasure. I hope that you had uh, an opportunity to, to hear something that might be a little bit new as you build on what you already know. And I look forward to continuing our discussions.